This is Roger Morier. Welcome to day three of the World Reconstruction Conference here in Geneva. The countries and the people and the communities meeting here have been talking today a lot about how to improve the international community's response, its agility, its capacity to respond to disasters and to help countries and communities rebuild and reconstruct after a disaster. A lot of the focus today has been on the words rebuilding and reconstruction. And there are many people here who say that rebuilding has to be used in its broadest term possible. That's the view of Kristalina Georgieva. She's the European Commissioner for Humanitarian Affairs and Crisis Response. When we sat down to chat, she said that, in fact, yes, the word rebuilding has to be about more than just bricks and mortar. When uh, a country is hit, especially by a mega disaster, the first thing we see is houses being destroyed, roads being washed away. What we don't see so well is what does it mean as trauma on people? What does it mean in terms of the future, how you can build institutions capable of protecting people from a repeat of this disaster? How you get kids to recognize that there are certain do's and don'ts that save lives in a case of disaster. And very often we focus on the um, physical infrastructure, but we forget that this other part, the social part, the institutional part is equally and maybe even more, more important. Now you talk about lessons of the past and learning about lessons of the past, but how relevant do you think some of those lessons are today when the world is changing so much, particularly, for example, with climate change looming? Mm -hmm. What we need to recognize is that uh, the world our kids are going to live in is going to be hopefully a richer world, but it is going to be also a more fragile, more vulnerable world. Uh, and uh, for that world, we have to, in a sense, think of the unthinkable, lift up the bar of what kinds of risks are going to be there, and try to think creatively how we are going to approach these risks. But there, there are things that we can learn from the past. Uh, we can learn from mega disasters of the past, like we learned from the tsunami in, in um, uh, Asia, that uh, you have to have good alert systems, and you have to preposition stocks so you can help people very quickly and not wait days and days until relief items are, are there. So there are valuable lessons from the past, but the world that we are going to be dealing with requires more imagination than just trying to do a little better what we used to do uh, before. Now, you talk about lessons and learning and obviously the key things to share that information, that knowledge with other people mm. who are affected, other countries. Do you think that the knowledge sharing that you're talking about is as effective as it could be or what could be done to improve it? Uh, it is still very fragmented, um, how we learn from uh, especially mega disasters. Uh, there is no tradition of taking stock and then utilizing the lessons learned and then share it with, sharing it with uh, everybody. Uh, and there is a responsibility for the global institutions to be the driver of this learning experience much more than they have done so far. There has to be a replication of what communities and countries do in preparedness, prevention, response, and then feedback, lessons learned, aggregate that and bring it up at a global level. But when you say global institutions, who, who are you thinking of in particular? Um, I think of uh, uh, two groups of institutions. Uh, one is the uh, development institutions like the World Bank, uh, the um, financial site like uh, the IMF, uh, um, and the institutions of the United Nations that have a responsibility to build capacity like UNDP. That is one block of institutions. But then we have global companies. The insurance sector as such can be a generator of lessons learned in this particular area and translating those lessons into actionable uh, follow-up. Um, at this point, I see traction in both areas, in the, uh, in the global institutions, public institutions, and in the global private uh, institutions, but I don't yet quite see them coming together and having a clear vision how together they can make a difference in this learning uh, feedback loop. Now, a couple of the things that we keep hearing over and over at this conference is about the issue of coordination of aid 
poor countries hit by disasters mm -hmm. and the issue of agility, that mm -hmm. people have to respond faster and mm -hmm. quicker. So what do you think are a couple of things, if there are, that could ensure better coordination and more agility? Uh, well, three things. First, uh, we have already seen that uh, joint needs assessment that are done by the countries affected and the international community in a coherent way work. They provide a common platform for action and they allow division of labor. They have to be the norm, not the exception. Second, it is very important for accountability purposes to have a regular stock taking of what has been achieved. Pledges are being made when a disaster hits, big conference, everybody makes pledges, but the cameras go away. Sometimes the m money evaporates, commitments evaporate. So we have to have a very disciplined approach to follow up on what we have done, where we are, what needs to be, to be done. And the third thing that needs to, to be uh, changed is uh, for the way we communicate to citizens. There has to be both at the local level and at the uh, uh, national global level, there has to be a better monitoring for results. Uh, ability to translate, if you wish, dollars into deeds. What, what have we achieved so that can serve as an accountability mechanism, but it, it can also serve as a guide of how we can be more efficient next time around. Now, the European Union has been a generous donor to recovery and reconstruction in other parts of the world, but the European Union is also a victim of disasters or catastrophes. What are the one or two things that you have learned as the European Union representative that you think could be applied or should be known by other countries facing what you've faced? Well, two, two lessons. Uh, one is uh, we have to create incentives for people to do the right thing in preparedness and prevention. Um, and that means uh, that, that there have to be conditions for receiving assistance. So you do the right thing, you can get money. Uh, we learned this the hard way. We provide funding. It doesn't get utilized. Why it doesn't get utilized? Because there is really no pressure, no accountability for, for integrating uh, the, the funds. And the second lesson we learned in Europe is that um, uh, there is truly only one way to be successful and it is to mainstream, to integrate disaster preparedness and, and, and risk reduction in, in, uh, in development. And that there has to be this, this circle that we go uh, over and over again. And it is your preparedness, prevention, response, rehabilitation, lesson, lessons, lessons learned. Uh, and we see that countries that do that, they are much less vulnerable uh, at the time of disasters, uh, they, that translates into life saved and of course economies uh, uh, being more resilient. But let me ask you a final thing and that is, what would you like to see, or the European Union perhaps mm. would like to see as the one outcome of this conference, let's say the one realistic outcome of this conference that mm. other countries could take away? The most important objective of the conference is to bring this mainstreaming integration of disaster risk reduction in development, both in, in developing countries and in the rest of the world. The one thing I hope to see coming out of this conference is a clear commitment that we are going to measure our risks, understand what they are, and have a way of integrating in our, in our actions this understanding of risks. Let me put it very simply. We need a risk management uh, mindset. We don't have it yet. We, have, we need it everywhere. We need it in the World Bank and the IMF. We need it in the national governments. We need it at a local level. For that to happen, people need to, be, to, to slice risks in, in measurable bites. They need to say, this is how much my risk is. And this is what the actions that I need to take to, to address it. This conference has the ability to translate risk management into policy actions that everybody at all levels can, can, can take. And it is not short of, of, uh, of a mindset uh, transformation. There is a very good uh, old story on how governance can be transformed. And so the story goes like this. There are two ways to transform global governance. One is 
realistic, the other one is fantastic. The realistic one is you have extraterrestrials coming for space, they take over our institutions, they get the job done. And the fantastic is we people do it ourselves. So my message to the conference is it has to make the fantastic option the one that actually works. We people take charge of our destiny. Rebuilding after a disaster has many objectives, and one of those objectives is to reduce the risk of the next disaster. One of the key global players in doing that is the global insurance industry. That's why I sat down with Ludger Arnold Dusen. He's a member of the board of the insurance giant Munich Re. We're here at the World Reconstruction Conference, and I wonder from your point of view, the insurance industry point of view, or the private sector point of view, what is the one thing that is missing globally in the whole process of recovery and reconstruction for countries that are facing a disaster? I think an important aspect that is missing is the sort of a, a strong incentive, I think, for prevention. For, for the governments to really occupy themselves with prevention issues before things happen and think about what will we do when, when disaster strikes. And uh, maybe that could be alleviated by introducing a, a, a worldwide institution that measures the, the preparedness for disaster or does audits and, and tells countries how did they improve on that. Because I think when we talk to to governments, I think it's very difficult for us to get really to the top level because I think the, the priority list of many governments is totally different. When you say difficult to get to the top level, what do you mean? Yeah, to, to the ministerial level, uh, really bring the topic of um, risk prevention or insuring against natural disasters on a, on a countrywide level, bring that really to the forefront of the agenda. There seem to be always so many different things, changes in government, so it is really a very slow process in promoting this. But the international community has been talking about this now for some time, the issue of yep. prevention. Mm. But do you think it's not been taken seriously enough? Or as you say, is it just the top people aren't focusing on it? Um, I think in, especially in the, I think in the developing countries, I think there are so many difficulties and pressure. So uh, pressures from different sides, I think, um, the, the, I, I have the strong feeling there's too little priority given to this because other things are also pressing and um, I think that needs to be changed. Now we are here at the World Reconstruction Conference which is dedicated to finding ways to improve recovery and reconstruction efforts after mm -hmm. a disaster. What do you think is the role of the private sector in that process, recovery and reconstruction? Um, I think uh, they are, that depends very much on the, the business area you're from. Let's take my area of reinsurance. Uh, I think the role that we could play there together with the primary insurers in the countries is really to give certainty to uh, the finances available if a certain disaster strikes. That is the concept of insurance, of saying what has to happen and what funds do I get. And I think that is something that would change the whole process. And insurance companies, for instance, they are used when a house used to, to settling claims, uh, controlling whether the money has been spent on rebuilding the house and things like that. So all this is available, but it's not really used. And why is it not used then if it's available? Uh, I think in many of the developing countries, the concept of insurance uh, hasn't really filtered through as it has in, in many other developed nations. And so you first you have to explain the value of insurance and then say, and this has something to do with your natural catastrophe exposure. And I think there is such a long way to go that I think this concept hasn't really caught on enough. Are there any examples today where that concept has caught on in a developing or a transition country? I think uh, the uh, earthquake in Chile that we saw uh, in the last year, I think that was a good example what insurance can do to uh, uh, speed up recovery. Uh, so for instance, that was a major claim for my company, Munich Re. Um, we have almost all the claims now, 12 months after the event, have been liquidated and paid in the meantime. So that means the funds were available for the reconstruction. And I think we have done 
seminars, uh, funnily enough, uh, uh, three months before the event with insurance companies in Chile, what to do in the case of a large natural catastrophe, how to maintain your business processes internally and handle the, the flood of claims. So when the disaster struck, the primary insurance companies in Chile, they pulled our seminar folder and called us and said, can you support us now it happened? And I think that is just a, a simple example how I think the private sector and insurance industry can support there. Now, in a number of developing countries, unlike Chile, for instance, there are poor countries with low GDP, mm. there are poor people. What role can the insurance companies play or the insurance industry play in those countries where people may not be able to afford insurance? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's where governments have to come in, or maybe, as I mentioned in the discussion, NGOs. Um, because I think the people need financial support to afford insurance. I think if you have to decide whether you buy a meal or you buy an insurance policy, uh, I think the decision is very clear. So I think their funding, in my view, could be much more efficiently directed to uh, buying insurance before an event rather than uh, drumming up a lot of public support after an event and then see how much can we get to do it. I think it's at the moment the wrong way around. Mm -hmm. Now, again, we're here at the World Reconstruction Conference. If there was one message that you think or one outcome from this conference that you would like to see, what would that be? Um, I would like to see, um, I think, really m more emphasis from the government side to find uh, also ins insurance solutions for this. And I think I would be really delighted if I had a talk with the first donor organization saying we want to buy uh, earthquake protection for Indonesia, for instance, you know, something like that. I think that would be a totally new approach and I think it could create a lot of benefit. Ludgar Arnold Dulsen from the Munich Re Insurance Company, member of the board, thank you very much. You're welcome. One of the main reasons why people have come to the World Reconstruction Conference is to share ideas, to share experience from communities or countries that have had the experience of a disaster and have been involved in recovery and reconstruction. And one of the main ways that they've been able to do this is through an innovation competition sponsored by the World Bank and the GFDRR and also other partners to find good local innovative ideas that other people can learn from. Over the course of three months, the World Reconstruction Conference Innovation Competition received an impressive 71 entries from 32 countries around the world. These innovative entries range from vernacular architecture, water and sanitation solutions and livelihood redevelopment. We realize that innovation means different things in different parts of the world. For example, following the Yogyakarta earthquake that happened in Indonesia, a women's livelihood redevelopment project was started. This entry on weaving livelihoods focuses on women's redevelopment and how to help them recover faster after the disaster. These, are, these and many other are examples of how people can recover through innovative solutions after disasters. As my colleague Raki said, there were 71 entries in this innovation competition from 32 countries and we're lucky enough today to have two of the top winners here with us. With me now is Beiruz Daruboev, who is the Program Development Manager for Habitat for Humanity in Tajikistan. Welcome. The project that you submitted is called The Use of Mulberry Branches in Home Reconstruction, Retrofit and Repair. So tell me, why did you focus on mulberry trees? Mulberry is an environmentally sustainable product or material in Tajikistan because it grows it's naturally abundant in all the rural territory of Tajikistan, where 75 percent of the population live. Second, it's a um, renewable material. It, you know, in order to stimulate the growth of the mulberry twigs, you need to cut it each year. The third, it's affordable material. It's free for the rural population. And the fourth, it, is, um, it has sufficient strength capacity to be used as a reinforcing element in house construction, especially in adobe, house, adobe type house construction. Mm -hmm. And the last but not the least, it's um, uh, really low tech you know, technology and solution. Because you know, in order to harvest the mulberry twigs, in order to do the, you know, the greets, the mulberry greets, it's like a mesh type element, you don't really need any specialized equipment and the whole population can be involved in this. So it's really low tech and high ownership. 
so low tech, high ownership, sustainable, affordable, and lots of mulberry trees. Sounds like a perfect solution for Tajikistan, but tell me it couldn't have been that easy. You must have run into some obstacles along the way. What was the hardest thing you had to deal with? Exactly, exactly. We faced during the implementation some uh, logistical challenges because uh, uh, the geographic coverage you know, of this uh, impact of this earthquake was so widespread that you know, we could not reach this isolated and remote communities we could not reach sufficiently thus we, we faced this challenge and the second was that it um, it did not involve sufficient media coverage you know and did not involve uh, enough humanitarian support thus you know we with, with more support and resources we could help more families than 350 well, those were a couple of challenges. You've overcome them because you've won this competition, one of the winners in the innovation competition. I wish you good luck in expanding even further. Thank you very much. One of the other top two winners who is with us today is Liu Yiping, who is the project manager for the Bamboo for Disaster Recovery Project, which originated in your home country of China. Could you tell us a little bit about this, and in particular, why did you focus on bamboo? Well, uh you know, in uh, the Sichuan earthquake, after the earthquake, there are lots of challenges. For example, they are shut off the uh, con construction material. The environment was design, uh, destroyed and they need uh, uh, the income and the job opportunity. So bamboo actually provide an uh, excellent opportunity for this for a few reasons. For example, first one, uh, first bamboo is locally uh, uh, available. It's uh, very abundant. For example, in Sichuan province, uh, there are about 1 million hectares of bamboo. Secondly, uh, bamboo is, very, as you know, maybe very versatile, can make almost everything which wood can make. And also bamboo is very light itself and very easy to be processed. So it's very good for the vulnerable groups. For example, women, the elderly, the disabled person. Then also, of course, bamboo is very environment friendly because bamboo is a grass. They are growing very fast. Once they are cut, they can regrow very quickly. And that will help to uh, uh, prevent deforestation. Then, of course, very, another very important point, bamboo has a very good earthquake resistant property because very, bamboo itself is very strong. And uh, in many cases, they can compare to wood and even concrete for the construction material. So I think take this kind of, all kind of advantages. We use bamboo as our uh, materials or maybe approaches to help the local people for their reconstruction after the devastating earthquake in Sichuan. So a lot of reasons to use bamboo, as you stated. Were there any significant obstacles, any hardships that you had to overcome in getting this project to where it is today? Oh yes, uh, this is a big project because we work with thousands of farmers, work, work with different government agencies and the different level of the, the, the uh, enterprises. So we face quite a lot of challenges. But the main challenges we have faced now in our implementation is how to bring the whole uh, production chain to be upgraded. Because our, our project is value chain approach from, you can say, from the resource mm -hmm. to the primary uh, process, then to the end products, to the marketing mm -hmm. for the consum consumers. So if we just work in a single product of technology, it's, it doesn't work in this project. Even, even, even though the, the pro the, this kind of technology is available, so our challenge is how to upgrade and how uh, the whole uh, bamboo value chain help the local people working with a better improved technology from resource, processing, market, finance, uh, everything. So we, we, we do it an integrated way. So this is a big challenge for us. So trying to integrate and make that whole value chain more efficient was a big yeah, problem, yes, but you've it, overcome it now. Exactly. Well, I hope you can overcome future challenges as well and grow this project for the benefit of other countries too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. This conference was organized by many partners, but in the lead was the World Bank, the United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Reduction, and the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery. The program manager for that global facility is here with me now, Saroj Jha. Saroj, I wanted to ask you, what was the original idea that drove the organization of this World Reconstruction Conference? 
Thank you. Uh, the world has witnessed uh, unprecedented suffering from major catastrophes in the last 24 months. Haiti earthquake, Pakistan floods, floods in Australia, earthquakes in New Zealand, and earthquakes and tsunami in Japan. I think it's time for us to look at how we prepare for such unprecedented disasters. And one of the ways to learn better actually from experiences is to bring together people and practitioners, the government, civil society organizations who have worked on large reconstruction programs. We also believe that large scale reconstruction programs provide uh, opportunity for us to really look at how we build resilience during reconstruction programs. So this conference is about making reconstruction a part of our longer term development agenda and we are partnering with the UNISDR in the third session of the Global Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction. And we are very happy to see reconstruction coming into the, the landscape of disaster risk reduction so that policy makers, project managers in countries after disasters when they engage in reconstruction, they make risk reduction an integral part of that reconstruction program. Now, you've talked about the number of people that have come here for the first time to talk about reconstruction, but they've been coming to having a lot of debates, discussion, they'll be coming to some sort of decisions. How is that going to be translated into concrete action on the ground? First of all, this conference provides an opportunity to look at what are the pressing issues uh, from a uh, perspective of uh, our partner countries, both in the North and the South and the people who are at the front line of uh, the major reconstruction agenda. We've been listening to them, we've been with them in the last few days in the conference. This is going to set the stage for a global thinking on a much more organized reconstruction. There are three broad elements here. One is that the international system needs to get its act together in terms of how we support the governments as a coordinated, coherent system, international system of donors, IFIs, UN organizations, civil society organizations. So we do hope that this conference will provide a basis for us to work together under a global framework for reconstruction. Second, I see that uh, the knowledge exchange uh, among the reconstruction practitioners across the world has to be much more streamlined. I think we have got all the elements of how such a global reconstruction knowledge practice can be organized, where we can help uh, a process by which Countries in need of reconstruction knowledge and global good practices can immediately access it from partners in North and the South. And third, I think which is extremely important, is that uh, it is also important to look at the issues of financing large-scale reconstruction. Um, under the global facility, we have been working with our partners in the United Nations, European Union, and uh, the I IFIs. We've been helping governments to do post-disaster needs assessments this conference is helping us to take this needs assessment agenda forward, help governments to prepare a reconstruction plan which is based on uh, experiences from other disasters around the world, bring the issues of risk prevention in the reconstruction agenda, and also help governments establish a much more predictable financing mechanism to meet the requirements of such uh, reconstruction plans. Okay. Now, I wonder a lot of what you're talking about involves a certain change in mentalities, a certain change in mindset among practitioners, among the people who are the decision makers. What do you think is the biggest change in mindset that has to take place? I would say that we really need a culture of working in partnership, working across our institutional boundaries, both in the multilateral system and also in the bilateral partners, putting governments in the driving seat in the reconstruction phase. This is very much uh, a work in progress that we see governments taking a stronger ownership of this agenda across the world. And uh, what I'm personally very delighted to see is more and more governments making disaster risk reduction a core element of their longer term development agenda. And this is very much in line with what the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery was established by UN, World Bank, and more importantly, our bilateral partners, uh, emerging economies around the world to help governments achieve these development objectives. Now, in terms of disasters and post-disaster recovery and uh, reconstruction, I know you personally have been involved in many, many of these operations around the world over the last uh, many years. I wonder, from the point of view of the people on the ground that you have met, what do you think are the most pressing needs on their part in terms of recovery and reconstruction? What are they looking for this conference to give them? 
they're looking for uh, they're looking for uh, I would say both knowledge and uh, fast track resources which can help communities to recover quickly after the disasters. We are looking for uh, mechanisms which can be much more efficient in terms of delivery of uh, recovery and reconstruction uh, interventions. And uh, this is an area where uh, World Bank has very good expertise in working in countries around the world, particularly our programs on owner-driven housing reconstruction programs. So we can really streamline the implementation of reconstruction interventions so that we can reach out to the communities very quickly and we see civil society organizations playing a very important role. Uh, also, I should say the, the role of women uh, self-help groups, the women networks in different countries, how we can engage with them early on and work with them in the post-disaster phase to reach out to the most marginalized people affected by the disasters. Now, I know, finally, Saroj, that you were at the birth of GFDRR. It was a vision that you had of, with other development uh, partners as well about what the GFDR could be. That was several years ago. Today, what is your vision of the GFDRR and, more importantly, your vision of reconstruction and recovery in the years ahead? It's a difficult question because uh, when we started working on this uh, with our colleagues at the World Bank, United Nations, partners around the globe, we had a level of understanding about the disasters that I and many of our colleagues had experienced in Asia, in Africa, in Americas. I think today our level of understanding is uh, much better, but we're also faced with uh, unprecedented challenges given the major catastrophes in the last two years. Situation is not going to be better in terms of uh, uh, the, the intensity and the frequency of disasters in the future. So therefore, yeah, I personally feel that uh, we've come a long way in raising the awareness and elevating the profile of disaster risk reduction as a development agenda. But we're also at a historical moment today when there is uh, interest and commitment uh, among the governments, international organizations to do more. As a manager of the global facility, my vision is to help these uh, organizations around the world and the governments to have a vision for a safer tomorrow. I am a, we are a very small player in this, but we are a good partner. We would like to play the role of an enabling partner and help others have the vision for a safer tomorrow and see how far we can support them to realize this vision in their countries. So, Ja, thank you very much. The World Reconstruction Conference closes soon, and when it does, the challenge will be for all of the delegates here to take the passion, the political commitment, and the will that they've displayed to change things, and to take all of those things and translate that into concrete action on the ground. That's a tall order, but for many people here, we have no choice except to work together to realize that dream. For the poor of the world, who suffer the first and the most from natural disasters, they expect no less. Roger Morier at the World Reconstruction Conference in Geneva.